Hey everyone, welcome back. So in this video, we're going to be talking about the math behind SVM. So I had a whole separate video on the intuition of SVMs, and I highly, highly recommend watching that first so you get an idea of what I'm talking about throughout this video. That video will be linked below. So let's get right into the math of SVM. Again, let's start with a real situation. So let's say that we are trying to predict whether or not a student gets into their top choice medical school. So we have n students, so all the way from 1 to n. And for each student, we have a vector of predictors, so things that's going to help us determine whether or not they get in. For the first student, that vector of predictions is x1, and then x2 all the way down to xn. And let's say for each student, we also have a response. So yi is going to be either 1 or negative 1. 1 if the student does get in, negative 1 if they do not. And of course, our machine learning problem for today is trying to build some kind of model that's going to use the predictors and try to figure out the response and we'll be using an SVM. So I've drawn below just a graphical representation of our problem. So this vector of predictors is going to be generally pretty large, but let's just look at it in two dimensions for now to keep things simple. So let's say that the two predictors we're looking at are the GPA of the student on the x-axis and the MCAT score of the student on the y-axis. So we see that students who generally have higher GPAs and higher MCATs, who are these green triangles, are getting into their medical school. So these are classified as plus one and students with lower values for these metrics generally are not. So these are red X's classified as negative one. Now in the spirit of SVM, as we learned in the intuition video, we want to create a maximum margin classifier, which means that we want to choose a decision boundary. So this blue dashed line here is called a decision boundary. We would like to create that such that the space around the decision boundary, which is called the margin, is as big as possible. The reason we want this again is because we want some breathing room between the two classes. So that's all from the intuition video. Now let's actually assign some equations to these lines. So this blue dashed line is going to be called w dot x minus b is equal to zero. And it helps in this video if you have some familiarity with vector algebra, but let me expand this for you so you can see better what's going on. So let's trace this arrow up. If I expand this equation, I get w1 x1 plus all the way to wp xp minus b is equal to zero. So it's easier to see what's going on now. This is simply the equation of a hyperplane. And since we're just dealing with two dimensions, for us, that's just gonna be the equation of a line. b is the intercept and w1 through wp are all of the coefficients. So this kind of implies that each vector here, x is p dimensional. So we have p predictors about the student. Now we have two other lines in this picture and they have very similar looking equations. So this top line, so this top blue solid line is given by w dot x minus b is equal to 1, and the bottom blue line is given by w dot x minus b is equal to negative 1. Now it turns out that w and b are the only two coefficients we care about going forward. If we can find good values for w and b, we're finished. And by good values, we mean values such that we maximize this margin. Now, all we need to do now is figure out what is an equation for the size of this margin, the margin being the space between the two solid blue lines. The first thing to know, if you go back to your vector algebra class or look at your notes, the normal vector is going to be w. And by normal, what we mean is perpendicular to the hyperplane. In this case, perpendicular to the line. So this vector here is w itself. Knowing that, we can start forming a story. We can say that, okay, Let's say that I am a vector x who is on the decision boundary. So if x is on the decision boundary, then it must follow the equation of the decision boundary, which again is w dot x minus b is equal to zero. So I'm here, let's say, and I wanna know how many units do I need to walk in the w direction in order to get to this other blue line whose equation is written here. The first thing I'm gonna do is make a unit vector who goes in the direction of w, which is simply w divided by the magnitude of w. So this is a unit vector who is in the same direction as w. So the story that this equation is telling is that if I'm at my current vector x, who again is on the dashed decision boundary, and I walk k units in the w direction, how many units do I need to walk? So what is k such that the new location I'm at is on this top blue line whose equation is given here. So it looks a little bit complicated, but once we kind of break apart this term, it becomes pretty obvious because we get w dot x, that's the first term here, plus k w dot w over magnitude of w. And this w dot x minus b, so this part 
and this part is what? We literally know that's equal to zero. So that goes away, this goes away, and we simplify and we get that k is equal to one over the magnitude of w. All I did so far is say that this distance right here, so this distance right here, so this distance given by the question mark here, is one over the magnitude of w. This is important because now we know exactly the size of the margin because the margin is simply just twice that amount. So now we know that the margin size is two over the magnitude of the vector w, w again being this vector of weights that we are choosing. So if I want to maximize the margin, I need to maximize this quantity, which is the same thing as minimizing the denominator. So I need to minimize the magnitude of w. So the first part of the story is done. We know that we need to pick some kind of w and b such that we're going to minimize this magnitude of w. But there's one constraint or a couple of constraints that we need to take into account. We need it so that whatever w and b we choose, everything on one side of this margin is classified as a plus one and everything on the other side of this margin is classified as a negative one. What does that mean mathematically? That means that if yi is equal to one, which means that if the student does truly get into their top choice medical school, then we need that w dot xi minus b is greater than or equal to one. What does that mean? So w dot xi minus b is bigger than or equal to negative one, which vectors obey that condition? We know that this would be a strict equality if we were on this top line, which means that it's going to be greater than or equal to if we are anywhere in this space over here. So we're saying that for all vectors who are in this space over here, we require that they get classified as plus ones, okay? So this is enforcing the condition that anything on this side of the margin gets classified as a plus one. And we can also make the second condition, the parallel condition, that if yi is equal to negative one, which means that the student truly does not get into their top choice medical school, then we need that w dot xi minus b is less than or equal to negative one. Which vectors in our picture obey that condition? That means that the vector would be on this side of the margin, which means that we require that everyone on that side of the margin is classified as a negative one, which again is exactly what we would want. So these two conditions together can actually be written in a compact form because notice that if we have yi equals one, we need this quantity to be bigger than or equal to one, which means that the product of these two quantities would be bigger than or equal to one. And if yi is equal to negative one, then this quantity needs to be less than or equal to negative one, which again means that the product of them is bigger than or equal to one. So in all cases, we need that yi times that quantity, this one, is bigger than or equal to one for all i going from one to n. Whew, okay, so that was a lot of math. I encourage you to rewind or stop or pause or write something on your paper if you need to check all these things for yourself. But the two big takeaways at this point are that we first learned that in order to maximize this margin, which is what SVM is trying to do, we need to minimize the magnitude of W, but we need to do that such that this constraint is being obeyed. And all that is summarized in this green box. So in this green box is the hard margin SVM problem expressed mathematically. We want to pick a W and B. So pick a weight vector and pick an intercept such that we're minimizing this W magnitude, which is the same thing as maximizing the margin. But we need to do that obeying the constraint that for all i going from one to n, we are obeying this condition, which is that yi times that quantity is bigger than or equal to one. And this is exactly the hard margin SVM problem. If we can find a w and b that satisfies this, then we have solved the SVM problem, okay? So that's mathematically a hard margin SVM. And the last thing I'll note here is that, of course, this is called a support vector machine. So where are our support vectors? The support vectors, you can actually now, you have all the foundation to figure out mathematically what they are. The support ve vector would be this green triangle and these two red X's who lie exactly on these two solid blue lines, which means that W times X minus B, X being any of those support vectors, is either equal to one or negative one. One if it's in the positive class and negative one if it's in the negative class, which means that when you multiply that quantity by its class label, you're going to get one. So that means the support vectors are exactly those such that yi times that quantity is equal to exactly one. Anything where it's greater than one are not support vectors. Those are the ones that are 
outside the margin, and those are the ones that if you were to shift them around in that space or shift them around this space, they're not going to affect the final outcome of the problem. Okay, so that was the math behind SVM, at least for the hard margin case. I think I'm gonna save the soft margin case for a second video, just so that we're not putting too much in this video. If you have any questions at all, please leave them in the comments below. Please like and subscribe for more videos just like this. I'll see you next time.